We are less than a handful of issues away from Nintendo Power's eighth year and getting ever closer to the launch of Nintendo 64 for with March uh, 1986 and issue number 82 with, thankfully, more games to review than last one issue, including one big one. Our cover game this issue is our big title, Super Mario RPG, along with some more promised information on the N64, which we are also now seeing called the N64 for the first time. In the letters column, we have some complaints about the le the Epic Center column. Well, good news, sort of, for the people writing the letters, less so for me. That's going to become less of a thing on the N64, as a lot of those RPG developers are going to go to the PlayStation 1, and to a lesser degree, the Saturn, because those are systems that work better for, well, JRPGs. In the power chart, Breath of Fire 2 is new to the poll, and we finally have a genre ranking again, this time for simulators. Our first game of the issue is College Slam. It's NBA Jam, but for collegiate ball, which means none of these athletes are being compensated for their theoretical likenesses, although no name, actual names are used attached to the stats. They are still using the stats of those athletes, just nothing else to identify them, and all that fun stuff. So, first off, there are no Pacific Northwest teams in this game. No University of Washington, no Washington State, no Oregon State, no University of Oregon, no Gonzaga, nothing. The only West Coast teams in the game at all are UCLA, USC, and UC Berkeley, which, as a person who was, you know, based out of the Portland area, is really frustrating. Doubly so considering that Gonzaga is actually kind of something of a basketball powerhouse, or at least has become such. So that, admittedly, I don't know where they were at collegiate basketball-wise at this point, but it still feels like an auto mission. Otherwise, it's like NBA Jam without any famous players attached to it, and with, and also as mentioned, it's doesn't have any of the teams that I'd want to root for, which means that while it plays well, it, it is, to me, inferior to regular NBA Jam, because regular NBA Jam has the, you know, the Portland Trailblazers, and Clyde Drexler, and Clifford Robinson, and all of them. So, it's, I mean, if I'm going to play a college sports game, I want to play as a team that I can root for. Like, you know, well... The Ducks, Beavers, Huskies, Bulldogs, Vikings, or Cougars, none of whom are in this game. And consequently, this game will not be entering my collection. It's been a while since we've covered a mascot platformer, and this issue we have a new one with Frantic Flea, with notes on the first five worlds of the game. Frantic Flea is like a bad knockoff of Flicky that is trying to use a more involved animation style with the game, in turn leading to the game falling down in a lot of ways. So, quick explanation we're trying to do, you are trying to collect a bunch of fleas and get them to the exit. That's your premise. And where the fault, and if you get hit, you drop your fleas. Now, that part itself is not a problem. Sonic the Hedgehog does this with, with rings. If I recall correctly, the original Flicky did this as well with the birds you're trying to pick up. But, the problem is here is that the enemies in these levels are damage sponges who respond basically infinitely. Which makes evading and disabling enemies incredibly frustrating, and that fact of how the health system works is a real problem. If the enemies were very quick, if you disable them quickly, but still endlessly respond, that would be fine. Because then you're like, okay, I have this strategy to put together for what enemies I can disable, have was able to quickly, and after I've collected all the fleas, I can route this way to reach the exit. That's fine. Um, if it was the enemies were something of damage sponges, but once they die, once you beat them, they were gone permanently, like, okay, I can navigate the level, figure out the route to the exit, clear out the enemies in my path, then collect all the fleas and go. That also would work. But, because it's both, that makes things immensely frustrating. Further, and this is all of this, aggravated by the fact that you don't just pick up the fleas when you run over them, or walk over where they are on top of the level. You have to completely stop your movement over the fleas that you are trying to rescue, hold your position, 
until the it basically gets pick, picked up and added to you in the trail of fleas following the sprite. And then you can continue to move forward to either collect further fleas or reach the exit. Which, again, because when you get hit, you drop all your fleas, makes getting hit immensely frustrating and makes discontinuing with enemies in general a utter nuisance. So, ultimately, between the hassle of having to you know, stop your movement, to pick up your fleas again when you get hit, and enemies responding as you backtrack from the level to collect all the fleas, it ends up making for a choice between an utterly tedious gaming experience and failing the levels. That's not a choice that is conductive to an enjoyable gameplay experience. Speaking of types of games we haven't seen in a while, we have a movie licensed game with Cutthroat Island, based on the film that almost killed the pirate genre, and which also almost killed the idiom in terms of popular culture of action films led by women. Thankfully, that is changing now, but still, eesh. We get maps and notes for several levels on the Super Nintendo version and for the Game Boy version. The Super Nintendo version of Cutthroat Island tries to be uh, sort of an amalgam of a brawler and a platformer with a general swashbuckling theme. There are times when it works. When it's throwing a bunch of guys at you and you're managing your environment to keep yourself from being surrounded and landing your attacks, it's great. Basically, whenever it fully invests and buys into the whole brawler side of things, that works well. And then, though, when it starts to step out of its domain, like a poor swords person, swordsman or swordswoman, it starts to lose its footing. In particular, the dueling sequences could have used a little more work, particularly considering they reduce your amount of movement. If they adjusted the game into more of a fighting game mode for those boss fights, where um, your enemies cannot move off the edge of the screen, um, it's like controller movement, special moves that sort of thing, um, that would work. I, that would be really engaging, and I would dig that. I even would love it if there was like a bonus unlockable mode, if you beat the game or something where it's like a fighting game. Like two-player sword duel. Like with, you know, speaking of the brawler genre, um, the, the original Double Dragon. But it doesn't. In fact, indeed, your opponent is able easily and regularly to just wander off screen and attack you from completely out of your reach, but still in their reach. In, and oftentimes using attacks that are basically unblockable. The platformer mechanics, in turn, mainly show up in auto scrollers, which are also generally awkwardly handled. And then, on top of all of that, there is the matter that the game only has one continue. Now, you can earn additional lives, but once you're out of those, you're done. As I've mentioned before, and we'll say again until Doomsday, or until we stop covering games with finite number of lives and continues, limited continues on a whole console release of a game makes no goddamn sense. If the game were an arcade port, ar ar yeah, an arcade version, and you were, had the arcade machine, you could set the game to free play. And if it's not an arcade game, then what's the point for limited continues outside of trying to screw over people who rented the game? Just give unlimited continues. Just do it. It's fine. Um, but nope, that's not what they did. The Game Boy version of Cutthroat Island has almost the opposite problem from its console version. It's almost too easy. The game takes the tack of trying to implement a more mash E2 button version of the combat system from Sid Meier's Pirates, and using that for the brawler sequences by pitting, you know, against no more than one opponent at a time. And the boss fights as a whole basically end up being limited in their animation and attacks due to the nature of the platform. Or, to put it another way, the Super Nintendo version of Cutthroat Island is bad, because it overestimated what they could pull off on the platform, and ultimately stumbled and fell while the Game Boy version is bad because they underestimated what they accomplished what they could accomplish on the system and thus basically ended up being kind of boring. We return to Super Mario Kart due to expand adding support for it with some general strategies for multiplayer, in particular the dual mode, or battle mode rather, getting the main focus of the article. 
We also return to DigiPen, the video game development school, with a look at a project from some recent graduates, a real-time strategy game titled Redshift. Considering that as of this issue hitting the uh, presses, or the, the newsstands rather, the RTS boom is on the horizon, like we've got Warcraft and I believe Command & Conquer out at this point, um, they may be in a pretty good place when that kicks off. Moving on to the Virtual Boy, we have 3D Tetris. It's top-down Tetris that uses the Virtual Boy's 3D effect to, to give a sense of the depth of field. Again, I'm not really able to properly cover these games, so I'm going to give this one a miss. Like, this is particularly one where not being able to play this in 3D m makes for a lesser experience in terms of evaluating it, because part of the whole gimmick is having that sense of depth, and I just can't get that. Next is uh, an interview with Ken Griffey Jr. with questions from the Nintendo website, making this article something of a proto-AMA. In Epic Center News, we have excerpts of some of the letters responding to Nintendo's call for support to get Enix to release some more Super Nintendo titles. We now have our cover game for the issue. The Super Mario RPG, the big collaboration between Nintendo and Square, and something of the swan song of their relationship before they go their separate ways. Nintendo, with the N64 and their focus on cartridge-based uh, architecture, and Square to the PlayStation 1, uh, and the ability with optical discs to have more data, more information from the game at less of a cost, and with what that will allow them to do with music and cutscenes and game mechanic, and, and among various other factors. There are notes on each of the party members and the game's mechanics. Super Mario RPG is a wonderful game. It is a light, colorful, approachable RPG, which captures a capture of the the Mario series and fits the mechanics of those games into a role-playing game nicely. The game has isometric environments, platforming, but unlike a lot of other titles with isometric gameplay, there's a very minimal penalty for failure if you miss a jump. The controls are simple and intuitive without being really condescending to the player, and the character mechanics for the combat are very easy to wrap your head around. Everything is explained well, um, while the tutorials can hijack gameplay somewhat. Um, they also are all optional, so once you've learned them, you can just skip them. And everything just it works very well. It is introduces all the concepts of the RPG from moving up to getting items and equipment and all that sort of stuff to audiences, new audiences, without feeling like it's speaking down to the player necessarily. I mean, yes, there's a degree of kiddiness to it, but the kiddiness to it feels more connected to the Mario side of things, with the general light and very tongue-in-cheek tone, than elsewhere. In fact, actually, I'd even argue that this game is the one that introduces that kind of tongue-wedged, firmly-in-cheek tone that would carry on to so many other Mario works in the future, particularly stuff like Sunshine, stuff like um, like Mario Galaxy, stuff like Luigi's Mansion, all that sort of thing. So, in short, Super Mario RPG is the perfect gateway RPG. For players who want something that gives them a challenge and respects their intelligence, but is also transparent about its mechanics and handles its narrative very well. Around the Super Mario RPG article, we also have some strategies for bosses in Yoshi's Island um, on the back side of this issue's poster. We also get a bunch of information on Tales of Fantasia, the first game in the Tales series. A game which, as far as the Super Nintendo goes, never comes out on the Super Nintendo in the United States. Super Famicom? Sure. Um, but Super NES? Nope. Indeed, you are better off either with the Game Boy version or getting a Polymanga and importing the Japanese PlayStation version so that you can run it with a translation patch. Because as it exists now, not so much. We have a very useful, very in-depth strategy guide for PTO2. This is not meant to replace the manual if you got the game without one, whether through rental or the used market or what have you. 
but it does help you take the information that you have once you've deciphered everything on what everything on the interface is and lets you use that to make start smart strategic decisions. In classified information, we get a whole bunch more codes with a K for Mortal Kombat 3. We have some strategies for offense and defense for the Game Boy version of NHL 96. Holy crap, NHL 96 for the Game Boy is bad. My emulator I was playing this at had this pegged at a solid 60 frames per second, only for the actual animation on the screen to chug spectacularly. Additionally, because the system the game is being played on, the, you know, the Game Boy, the original Game Boy, is a mix of monochrome and grayscale that makes it incredibly hard to tell who the hell you are controlling on the screen at any one time, meaning on multiple occasions I just couldn't, you know, do proper defense because I didn't know where the, the, the player I was, you know, moving was on the field, or ice rather. Our last game of the issue is Smurfs, a platformer based on the cartoon characters, or it it would be, but I couldn't get the game to run. Also, I think this game only got an EU release, so there's that problem too, or European release, I should say. In Kowser's Corner, we have some tips for Breath of Fire 2 and Yoshi's Island. No also rans in the now playing column this issue, though we do get a recap of the Virtual Boys library. Well, the Nestor Awards are basically no more. There, now there is just the Nintendo Power Awards. We have a variety of categories this year and a lot of nominees that go across multiple categories, so I'll be covering my picks for or I have multiple games for those categories, or as I should say, one game across multiple categories at once. For Chrono Trigger, I would definitely consider it my pick for Best Sound, Story, Epic Game, and would consider it as being robbed as a possible nominee for Best Hero, Best Sidekick, Best Villain, and Best Move for, respectively, Chrono, Frog, Lavos, and The Cross Slash. Um, we also have it nominated for uh, Best Baddie for The Juggler, which I would pick among the other nominees, and for Best also, I would pick The Epoch for Best Transportation. And I'd also consider it Best Overall Super Nintendo Game and definitely Best Ending, or Endings, I should say. Um, like, even some of the bad endings are pretty good. For Yoshi's Island, I pick, would pick that for uh, Best Graphics and Best Challenge. I would pick Killer Instinct for Best Tournament Fighter and Best Multiplayer Game. Doom is nominated for the Ouchie Award for Best Mature Rated Game, and I think it definitely fits there. And <laughs> the Chainsaw is nominated for Best Weapon, and you know I'm going for that one. Um, for Mega Man X2 is not even best play control. I definitely feel that one's worth picking there. For best puzzle game, I'm going for Mario's Picross. For most innovative game, I'm going for Ogre Battle as a, another game trying to adapt the real-time strategy format in a slightly different form to the um, console for the Super Nintendo. For best game based on a movie, I'm going with Judge Dredd. It adapts the film fairly well as good engaging gameplay and also does the smart thing of taking things the next step further to the Dark Judges part. For funniest game, I am going with Earthbound. For coolest code and trick, I am going for the uh, Street Fighter uh, little fighting game thing in uh, Mega Man. For best Game Boy game, I'm going with Kirby's Dream Land 2. And because we have a ignoble award here for most annoying quote feature, I am going for the unlimited respawning enemies in Mech Warrior 3050 because that game didn't need those. And finally, in the Pack Watch column, our focus this time isn't a game, but rather an interview with Genyo Takeda about the N64, which now is officially no longer called the Ultra 64, but the Nintendo 64. My pick of the issue is, after much deliberation, Super Mario RPG. I mean, it's a classic. It's the game which basically led off to the Mario and Luigi series of games with taking that turn-based um, with dynamic, dynamic action inputs is the wrong term, but with um, 
uh, with using button inputs to improve the, your level of success and that sort of thing. For that matter, it kind of introduced that mechanic in a way that would later be more heavily used by Square Enix in Final Fantasy VIII. It is a game that, from a roleplay game standpoint, mechanically is very approachable and easy and relatively easy to get into. Um, it's like it's not quite the gateway RPG to an extent that, say, you know, Pokemon will be in a few years of the magazine, but still, it's a really, really solid title. And like it's like it's definitely worth picking up in some manner or another. Um, cartridge. Um, if I don't think it's gotten on um, the uh, Nintendo uh, Switch Online for Super Nintendo yet, I can I'll have to go back and double check. I have it. I think it did get out on Virtual Console on either the Wii U or the Nintendo 3DS on New 3DS rather. Because um, that's the one that did, does N64, N64 but does um, uh, Super Nintendo games. So if you have either of those, I'd recommend picking up that way also. also and you don't have the option to play uh, Super Nintendo cartridges. It is definitely worth your time. Of course, if all else fails, I have no objections with emulation. Next issue, we are going to start getting more seriously into N64 games with Shadows of the Empire. enjoyed the show please like and subscribe i also consider backing my patreon patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future let's plays also please consider backing my coffee uh toss me a few bucks also help support the show and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that <laughs>